let's jump right into the meat of this video. I ran a series of in-game benchmarks using the Andromeda PC build behind me, more details on it in the card right here, in the 1080p preset, which is pretty standard for most Steam users. Now the catch is that I ran the first set of benchmarks in the highest possible preset, so Ultra, Max, whatever you want to call it, I turned the dials up on everything the highest that they would go for each of the games tested. And then I ran the exact same set of benchmarks again in the lowest possible presets. The point of this video is to analyze CPU and GPU scaling, how those change as in-game settings change. Also, we look at RAM allocation system RAM, not VRAM. It's pretty obvious how VRAM works at this point. Uh, but does system RAM change as we change in-game settings? And then we also take a look at frame times and frame rates for a few of the games tested as well, just so you, know, you can kind of get an idea for uh, system stability. At least at this point, we have two 1080s in here and an i7-6700K. So we'll see which games bottleneck which part of our build. So without further ado, let's jump into our first benchmark, which is as usual, Grand Theft Auto 5. What we're looking at here are average and minimum frame rates. Don't worry, our frame times will be on the next graph. Those will tell a better story than these two parameters alone will. Now, in 1080p Ultra, 119 FPS on average. That jumps up by 50 FPS when we lowered everything. Uh, but our minimums are a bit interesting. So our lowest FPS reading was 31 for our low preset, but that jumped up to a whopping 80 when we set everything to Ultra. In a nutshell, here's what's happening. When you lower in-game settings, your graphics card will, as a result, not have to work as hard. It's not having to include as many textures it won't have to be as detailed with each frame, right? Anti-aliasing, all of that, it doesn't have to worry about. So that in turn puts more stress on the CPU because now the graphics card says, well, I can process more frames because these frames aren't as detailed. So CPU, send me more frames to process. And the CPU's like, oh, I'm trying, I'm trying, I can't keep up. That's how you get frame skipping. That's how you get these severe drops in FPS like we're seeing in GTA 5. And we can see that happening in this graph here. Both of our GPU usages were cut in half as a result of lowering those settings. Our CPU usage also dramatically increased, which gave us that CPU bottleneck. We can see this happening from a frame time perspective as well. The y-axis is indicative of time, it's the time in milliseconds it takes for each frame to be rendered. The blue track is the ultra preset. We don't see many spikes high up, which is good. If we see the high spikes, it means it's taking longer for each frame to render. That gives us a lower FPS. The frame times are literally the inverse of FPS. Instead of frames per second, it's seconds per frame. Now, the low track, which is an orange, resulted in quite a few frame time spikes, which is not good. All of these spikes here indicate some severe stuttering. Check out these toward the end when we were on the ground driving the Hummer. These are incredibly large spikes in comparison to what the normal track is down below. If you don't take anything else away from this graph, remember this. The more consistent the line and lower the line is to zero, the better. This is not good over here. Not at all. The next game on our list is City Skylines. Now, this game utilizes resources in a completely different way than Grand Theft Auto V does, and we see that first off with our GPU usages. Right off the bat, GPU2's usage was extremely low in both scenarios, which tells us that the game is not properly SLI optimized. The CPU's usage throughout was also very interesting. It was 91% on Ultra, even though our graphics card was also being utilized heavily. That didn't change much when we lowered in-game settings. It only jumped up by 5%, but to be frank, there's not much more room for this CPU to, uh, to be bottlenecked any more than it already is. This game is extremely CPU bound and that's why I like using it for just typical gaming benchmarks. An interesting note though, when we look at the frame rate graphs, we know that we're not getting the whole story because we just looked at utilization. So our CPU usage was pretty much maxed out even though we did see a pretty substantial bump in frame rates across the board. Also, our second graphics card wasn't being utilized. We wouldn't know that either if we were just looking at this graph here. Some of you might remember this next game, Universe Sandbox 2. I actually did a full-on dedicated video on this game and how it bottlenecks the heck out of most CPUs. Check it out in this card right here if you haven't already. To be short and sweet, this game doesn't utilize graphics cards much at all. I would imagine we could just swap these 1080s with like 950s and the frame rate would probably still be similar to what it is on the next graph. 86% for CPU usage though on the Ultra preset, that jumps up by 10% when we dropped everything to the lowest possible preset, giving us, according to this graph here, a higher frame rate but a much higher CPU usage. Also notice that our graphics card usages didn't really drop by all that much uh, in terms of just proportionally percentage wise when we lower those in-game settings. So this game is extremely CPU bound no matter what. But again, if we looked at just the frame rate graphs, we wouldn't know the full story. Now the last game on our list is the complete opposite in terms of what it utilizes. Universe Sandbox 2 took advantage of the CPU heavily, didn't care much about the graphics cards. 
Crisis takes advantage of as much graphics card horsepower practically as you can throw at it and doesn't care as much about the CPU. Check this out, our CPU usage did not change from 20% when we lowered settings from ultra to low, while our graphics cards experienced a more than 50% cut in usage across the board. CPU just doesn't care. And while this is an Nvidia optimized title, I am pleasantly surprised by how well this game handled an SLI 1080 config despite its age. Again though, same story with our average and minimum frame rate graph. We saw a huge frame rate increase, especially in the averages when we lowered in-game settings, but we would have no idea how our CPU or how our graphics cards were responding to this frame rate jump if we just changed things and didn't look at usages in particular. But before you go on thinking that the Crisis developers had no idea what they were doing when they weren't utilizing the CPU as much as they possibly could have, here's the frame time graph. Despite our CPU usage not changing when we lowered in-game settings, our frame times were extremely consistent and a bit lower than our ultras, which makes sense because our average frame rate for our low run was considerably higher than that of our ultra frame rate. So this is a good sign. I mean, this is actually a really excellent graph for Crisis considering our CPU wasn't being heavily stressed much at all. In fact, my temperatures for my i7-6700K at 4.5 GHz didn't pass 50C at all. At this point, something else I want to talk about that I mentioned earlier in the video, how system RAM is allocated when we change in-game settings and how that varies from game to game. From this radar here, GTA 5 utilized by far the most system RAM, about 9GB that dropped to about 8GB when we lowered in-game settings. City Skylines, on the other hand, actually increased in its system RAM usage when we lowered in-game settings, perhaps because our CPU usage did substantially increase. Universe Sandbox really didn't care how much RAM we had in the system, to be frank, and neither did Crisis, but Crisis is a considerably older game, again, CPU usage was extremely low, and Universe Sandbox relies on physics calculations, which the CPU typically handles, but not much memory is having to be temporarily stored to be drawn later, it's, it's just, you know, it's just space, it's pretty much empty. And alas, we've come to our final compiled data chart. I have RAM usage, CPU, and GPU usage all in here. Not frame rates though, because those are typically a lot higher than usages by percent. If you want to download all of the data that I've explained and showcased in this video, you can do so by clicking the link in the video description. It's tied to my Dropbox account. So you can download the Excel sheet there and use it for your own testing, your own videos, whatever. Just say where you got this stuff from, because if you don't and somebody asks you a pretty detailed question, you're gonna look kind of stupid when you don't know the answer. Lastly, here are all of the average frame rates. Just make note of the system specifications, which are also in the video description if you're going to use these somewhere else. With that, if you like this video or appreciate the data presented, be sure to give this one a thumbs up, thumbs down for the opposite. Click subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will catch you in the next video. Here's a special treat. The i7-7900X. I think it's stupid for 99-ish percent of you, but uh, we're going to run some tests on it anyway. What the heck? It's here, right? This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us. Thank you.